In this tutorial, we will learn everything about REST APIs. We will start by documenting an API and we will use that documentation, which is an open API specification, to auto-generate our microservice in any language we wish. I created chapters so you can find whatever you need. Let's get started. A solid design starts with three preparation steps. We collect requirements, we use the requirements to define resources, and we create a high-level plan of our API. Let's start from the requirements. We are going to create an API to manage the product catalog of an online store. We need to support all CRUD operations, including getting a list of all products in the catalog. We will also cover result pagination, authentication and authorization. The product resource representation has the following properties. ID, name, price, description, and last updated daytime. The type and format shown on this table are those we will use in the OpenAPI specification. I will show you a screenshot of the specification as we move along. You also find the link in the description, so you can consult them at your own pace. If you notice, I purposely made the decision to use string as the identifier type, because I want this specification to be future-proof. I don't see value in restricting identifiers to numbers. Things can go wrong in our API, and if an operation fails, we need to give information back to our client. Thus, we also plan the representation of the error. We are going to keep it simple and just have one message property. We are now going to create the high-level API design. This is just a table where we make all the key decisions about our API. On the left-hand side, we list our operations. Then we start filling the rest of the details. Let's start by the path. The list products operation should return a collection or an array of all products in the catalog. Thus we name the path using the plural as products. We use the same path for the create product operation because we are actually adding a product to the catalog collection in this operation. Since the path is the same, we need to distinguish the two operations using the HTTP method. We define the HTTP methods according to the HTTP semantics internet standard. List products is obviously a GET. GET is a safe method. In other words, it indicates a read-only operation. A POST is neither safe nor idempotent. This means that we do not guarantee that identical POST requests are accepted. For other operations, we are going to use the slash products slash id path. The id is a path parameter and will be unique per product, which is exactly what REST constraints command, a unique URI per resource. As for the methods, get and delete are obvious choices. Put is used for updates because we want that operation to be idempotent. A client can repeat the same update multiple times and expect the same result. Now we can define the request bodies. The only operations accepting a request body are create and update product. We expect a product representation in the body. Now time for the successful responses. List products returns an array of products. The rest returns a single product, while delete has no payload. We also need to define the HTTP status code. We keep it simple and always use 200 OK, which means the request was accepted and completed successfully. We could use 201 for the second operation. I'm going to say something controversial here. If you're just starting, keep things simple. 200 OK is perfectly fine as a status code. Most developers want to know just if the request was successful or not. The moment you go into semantics, things can become complicated. You can have a lot of discussions. You may end up being inconsistent in the way you design your APIs. So that's my advice. Now it's up to you. For the delete request, we return to a four, which means no content, which makes sense because in that particular request, we will not return a product back. Next step is to define the error responses. 
here we have one representation, the error. However, we have multiple error codes. We can define ranges or classes of status code. For XX is used for client errors, which means the server did not accept the request. Then each individual status code goes into more detail. For instance, 404 means not found. It makes sense to have it for these operations because the client might give us an unknown identifier. We can also use 404 in multi-tenant systems to hide resources that belong to other users. 5xx is for errors on the server side. Usually these are unexpected, like an null pointer exception. And if we intend to secure the API, we also need to add the 401 and 403 errors. 401 is used when the request could not be authenticated. Maybe the client did not issue a valid API key or JWT token. While 403 means forbidden. In these cases, the request was authenticated, but the user lacks the rights to perform the operation. We're done. Now it's time to create the specification. For this tutorial, you have two options. If you don't want to install anything on your machine, use the online Swagger editor. Just clear the pet store example before and you're ready to go. I will be using Visual Studio Code. I already installed the OpenAPI extension by 42 Crunch to be able to render the documentation while we create the specification. We create a file named openapi.yaml and we define the OpenAPI version we intend to use. The bare minimum is to have an info section with title and version. However, we also add the description, so our documentation will look good. You can use Markdown here. I like to add servers at this stage. These are the URLs where the API is exposed. I use this portion of the path to route traffic to the backend. The version is single digit because once I include it in the URL, I cannot change it. If we do, we break existing integrations. The paths is the object where we define API operations. Components is the object where we can define reusable portion of the specification. We open the documentation tab and it's already rendering. We have our description and server selection as well. We know that we have three resources in our API, the product, the product array and the error. We define them under the components schemas. I will skip the typing here to make the tutorial more concise. However, I am giving you the full specification in the description. So don't worry about copying each field from the video. This is the product definition. It's an object with properties. A property must have a type. It can optionally have a format. These are the types and formats supported by OpenAPI. The product array is of type array. An array has items. Now, rather than defining a schema, we can use a reference to the product using the ref keyword prefixed by the dollar sign. Last step is creating the array representation. This is a simple object with a message field. You could make it more complex if you want. We can look at the documentation and we should see a schema section with our resources. Before defining our API operations, we also need to prepare the request bodies and responses. The only request body we need is the product request. Its definition is very simple. We just reference the product schema and wrap it into a content object where we define the supported media type, which is JSON in our case. Next is the responses. The product response is identical to the product request. We move quickly to the product array response. Same thing. The only difference is that we are now referencing the product array schema instead of the product one. Now we define all array responses. The structure is also the same for errors. In this case, they point to the same resource, the error. I could have used just one error response to save time. But if you want to have different error descriptions in your documentation, 
you need to define different response objects. First operation we implement is list products. We already did the plan, so we don't need to discuss the API design. Let's just see how we define it in the OpenAPI spec. Operations are created in the paths object. We define the path, method, summary, and description to describe our operation in the documentation. The operation ID is used for the code generation phase. We have no request body, but we do have responses. Let's just create references to all the objects we created. As you can see, we need to define the status code for our response. We can use numbers or ranges, like for xx. We can also use the default keyword, if we just want to have a message for any unexpected error. We were able to create references here because we invested time into creating reusable components. Otherwise, we would need to define the content type and schema in here, and it would become very messy. Let me remind you that I'm giving you this specification in the description, so you don't need to copy. You can focus on getting the concept, so later on, you can work on your own. Let's have a look at the documentation now. We see the list product operation rendered. Everything looks in order. We also got examples in the responses. The only thing I don't really like is the default appear. That's a tag. To get rid of it, we need to define tags in our specification file. A tag can also point to external documentation. Once we do that, we also need to tag our method using the same name of the tag we define. If we look at the documentation again, now we have the list products nested under the property tag. Let's move to create products. I went ahead and filled the create product operation. If we compare it to list products, we just added the request body section. At this point, we got the end of defining an operation, so I don't want to waste your time. Let's look quickly at the documentation. Summary and description are fine, but I don't like the request body in the example. I don't want the client to specify the ID and last updated fields. I want the server to control that. Here there are two schools of thought. Some developers would define a new resource to use exclusively for the request body. I like to reuse my main resource and just mark the read-only properties. Once I do that, the documentation renders exactly as I wish. We move now to the remaining operations. Since we know how to define operations, I will just explain how we describe a path parameter in an OpenAPI specification. The read, update and delete product operations are all exposed under this slash products slash id path. The id is a parameter. Thus, we create a parameter section. We could have multiple parameters, that's why this is an array. The name needs to be identical to the one we defined in the path. The in property defines the parameter type. We could also have a query or cookie parameter. The parameter is required and we can also define its type, which is a string. Once we declare the parameter, the rest is plain sale and identical to whatever we did before. This is the read product operation specification. This is the update product. And finally, the delete product. Notice that for the delete product, we don't have a schema for the 204 since there is no content to be returned to the client when the operation is successful. If you forgot how we define an operation, go back to the list product chapter. You can find it in the description. Let's have a look at the documentation. What do you think? It looks great to me. In a few minutes, we managed to create something that will help developers understand our API quickly. Whenever we return an array of resources, we need to think ahead of time and understand if we expect the size of the array to grow too large. 
Retaining always a large array in a single response can in their performance. Some software might deny it altogether. In these scenarios, we leverage pagination. There are mainly two techniques, offset and cursor base. The cursor can be optionally tokenized. The offset is used to populate the typical data table, while the cursor is used for infinite scrolling. Let's look at how we introduce pagination in our specification. We create a paginated result schema. We define the offset, limit and total properties, which are meant to describe the page. Then we declare the data field, which is a generic array. Notice how we do not specify a type for the array's items. Now we are going to use an it trick. We are going to modify the product array response to return the array in pages. We want to combine the paginated result with the current definition. To do that, we use the all of keyword, which is going to validate the response against multiple elements. The first is the paginated result, while the second is an object that overrides the data property in order to reference the product array. If we look at the documentation, we can see the example as already updated, and it looks great. We have our page with offset and limit. However, there is something missing. We forgot to define the query parameters that the client can use to request a specific page. We already know how to define parameters. We fetch the list products operation and add the two parameters, offset and limit. This time they are query parameters, not path parameters. We made them optional and because of that we need to define a default value. Let's look at the documentation now. Perfect, parameters are in place. Unless we are creating an API open to the general public, we want to protect it with authentication and authorization. It's good practice to document which protocol we're using. We do that in OpenAPI by defining a security scheme in the component section. In this example, I'm showcasing an O2 client credential flow with one scope. This means that an authenticated client needs the product scope to be able to perform operations on the API. Once the security scheme is defined, we need to decide whether it applies to specific paths, operations, or the entire API. I will just show you how to set it on the entire API. We create a security element, referencing the security scheme. We also need to define the scope. Once we do that, we can look at the documentation. You should see an authorized section. If we click it, we get an explanation of the protocol. And if the app was running, we would even be able to try it out. If you are using the online Swagger editor, we just access the generate server or client function. We have several options like Golang, Python, Node, and Java. You can create as many as you want. An archive is generated and downloaded. Then you can extract that archive and open the folder within your favorite IDE. I will show you that in the next section. If we want to work on the command line or integrate code generation in a CICD pipeline, we can use the OpenAPI generator CLI. This tool accepts an input specification and any of the supported generators. Here you have even more choice than the online Swagger editor. Once you install the CLI, it takes one command line to generate an application in the current folder. This is the Java Spring Boot generation. As you can see, it just takes few seconds. The same goes for Python. Let me show you briefly how I customize a Java Spring Boot microservice. Once the code is generated, either through GUI or command line, we can open it with our favorite IDE. We can inspect the folder structure and the created files. We can also launch it. The app is functional and it is returning our coded example already in the response. All you need to do is fetch the controller class 
and start implementing the interface methods. This is how I mock the implementation of the get product by ID. If we relaunch the app and repeat the request, you can see the response has changed. Let me show you quickly how we can do the same for a Python application built with Flask. If you want to skip authentication, you need to remove the security details from the specification first. Let's do that as it's not the scope of this tutorial setting up authentication with Flask. We generate the code and import it in the IDE. Now we follow the instructions in the readme. One command installs the necessary dependencies. The other launches the application. Once the application is running, we fire a request. It dances, but not what we expect. The file you need to modify is products.controller.py. Let's return our mock object and relaunch. If we try our request again, we can see the customized server. Now I leave it up to you to build your next system with this approach. Before we close, let's have a look at the documentation to showcase its ability to try out requests. I have my application running locally, so I choose the local environment server. I choose an operation and I fire the request. As you can see, we see the result and also the equivalent curl request. In this tutorial, we learned how we can use the API-first approach. We created the OpenAPI specification and through that we were able to auto-generate our microservices. I did not touch all the concepts of OpenAPI, I also rushed during the code customization. In any case, if you want me to go deeper or if you want me to touch another topic, please leave me a comment. I thank you, like and subscribe. And now, time to learn something new.